guys, what's up? In this video, we're going to talk about some of the amazing updates that Figma has recently introduced regarding prototyping. This update was released on yes, released yesterday on the February 27th, and I can see a bunch of people already making videos about them. And they're talk, trying to talk about like, hey, this feature is really cool, or this one is really cool. But what we're going to be doing in this video is ideally going through all of the different updates that are there, understand them, and obviously start using them. So the first one is, the device frames. The inline viewer now shows mobile prototypes in a draggable, resizable de device frame. So let's just have a look at it. So I have this design here. I'm just gonna open it up. Like for example, in the previewer, obviously you can do that by pressing shift space. And now I can, let's say, resize it. Maybe I don't really want it that big. I want it on the top right. Maybe here, I can resize it. I can do whatever it is exactly the way that I actually want it to. And I can position it. Um, based on the size that it actually is. So that's an amazing update. I personally feel like, again, this really helps us uh, play around and not really have this in our face and just, let's say, interact with it while we're working on the file. So you can have it open on the side and obviously you can keep on working. So that's number one and I love it. The other one is copy and paste and delete nodes. So when a node is selected, let's say I'm gonna go here as you can see, we have this particular plus button. And let's say we have this plus button move here. Obviously we can delete it by pressing delete. That is pretty obvious. But let's say if we want to copy this particular interaction for all of the other plus buttons that actually are here, I can just let's say command C or copy it from here. And I can select all of these different plus buttons in my prototype. Like for example, I can just press shift and I can select all of them and I can press command V. And as you can see, all of these are now, now going to be linked. So I can easily just copy and paste my interactions, which is pretty cool as well. Drag to delete a starting point. Now this is also a great functionality. So sometimes we actually have different flows that we don't really need like flow one, flow two, et cetera, created. And it's hard to delete them because you actually can't really delete them from here. Obviously you can, you can go to and press minus, but it's not as obvious, right? And let me just add it once again. <clears throat> or you have to deselect everything, you have to go here and then you can select, click on it and then press delete. Obviously that's not easy as well. So if you wanna delete it, you can just move, hold it, press it outside and delete it. Pretty simple as that. You don't have to go anywhere or anything. It's just easily deleted. Similarly, I can just delete this one as well, which is pretty cool. Okay, so the other one is disabling shortcuts. So usually what happens is, and if I'm gonna open the larger prototype here, usually we have shortcuts in prototypes and a lot of clients particularly are just navigating using shortcuts and sometimes these arrow key shortcuts aren't really most reliable because we want the client to actually navigate to certain things using the buttons. So if you actually wanna go ahead and ask the client to actually navigate to certain things using the arrow keys or whatever, we can ask them to just enable or disable the Figma keyboard shortcuts and now even the arrow keys won't work. You can only navigate to this prototype using the interaction points that are already there. So that's the update. I mean, I'm not really excited about it, but it is what it is. Allow zeros as a user can now set the width and height values to zero. I don't think this is related to prototypes, but previously when we were setting values of heights and widths, we used to do 0 0.0000 or something. Um, now you can just say the height is gonna be zero, the width is gonna be zero, and that's pretty much it. And this is obviously going to come in handy when let's say we actually wanna create a stroke on the right or something along those lines, we can just set the width to zero. So this can be handy, but obviously the stroke needs to be on the outside or the center to have it to make it work. Enable multiple after delays. Now this is a great feature as well. A lot of people may not really understand how to exactly use them, but now you can actually set after delays on elements themselves, not only on the top element, but on little elements themselves. Like for example, this button, I'm gonna say, that when the screen opens up, the intro screen, and let's just go actually to the intro screen. So when this intro screen opens up, after a delay, it's automatically going to transition to the other side. But now you're gonna say, hey, why is this really necessary if I, I can only go to another frame, and even if I had, let's say, an after delay on this, like for example, I can go here, I can set an interaction, I can say after a delay, of let's say 1500 milliseconds, I want you to do something. So even if I have that, it's not really gonna work, right? Because the first animation is gonna trigger, it's gonna go to the new page and the previous animation, no matter what it is doing on the previous screen, after a delay, it doesn't really matter. Let's say we actually had an interaction that this screen is gonna go automatically to that screen instead of on tap, automatically to the other screen, let's say after, I don't know, 
2000 milliseconds, right? So now if we, let's say, just go to our cards, let's just open them and we can see the delay working. So now you can obviously set a delay directly here. Let's just update that as well. So we have these cards. Let's, as soon as you land on the card screen, it's automatically after 2000 milliseconds, it's gonna go to the other one. But imagine if I wanted to add an interaction here as well on the cards, maybe just some minor animation. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it here. Let me just again resize this a bit. And we have two variants here. In the first variant, what we basically want is we want a negative uh, spacing in between these elements. So imagine something like this. They were a bit together or even more together. Let's see. I don't think I would be able to uh, change that too much. So let's just go ahead and actually remove the auto layout, move this here. And let's move the add new card button. Actually, let's even just get rid of the add new card button. So we had something like this. I'm gonna say that after a delay, I want you to go here. And after a delay of, let's say, I don't know, 500 milliseconds or 800 milliseconds, that's fine. I want it to ease out in 500 milliseconds. So we go to the cards. And actually, we don't even want that big of a delay. Let's just, as soon as we go to the cards, this animation should, the after delay animation should work. And let me just see if I actually messed up something. So yeah, 200 milliseconds. I feel like if we actually do something simple, like zero or one, M one MS, it doesn't really work. So we have something like this, and then it's automatically going to go to the other screen. So you have multiple after delay interactions in the same frame. So yeah, we have change to on a nested variant. A user can now use the change to interaction on a nested variant where the interaction will change the parent component variant for this particular one imagine you have an accordion like this so an accordion that basically expands and contracts when you click on the header and as you can see it's set up here but now you can actually go ahead and I, as you can see i have an instance of another component inside of this larger component and i want to say that if i also click on this like for example if i click on this, I want you to change something. So I want, it's gonna ask me, what do you want to change? I'm, I'm gonna say, I want you to go to the unexpanded state. So not only is this component, this larger component actually gonna trigger a change to here, but little instances of other components that are being embedded into this larger component are also gonna do that. So now if we have a look at it, I'm just gonna press shift space. We can go here, we can expand and contract here, but I can also click on this to uh, hide it and then expand it, hide it, expand it, hide it. So this particular functionality is there as well. Let's go to the other one. We have auto exit scale. So this is a pretty simple one, which is um, a problem that was minor, where if you had your cursor selected, or let's say if you had the, the scale tool selected. So I'm just gonna select the scale tool. You can select it by pressing K here. And if you were selecting or going to the prototype view, the scale tool may remain selected. And then you weren't able to, let's say, change the prototype nodes or something along those lines. But now, as you can see, as soon as I move to the prototype view, the move tool gets selected. So they fix that as well, which is a minor interaction, but it's good. Copy link of a selected flow. A new copy link icon button has been added next to the flow label. So obviously this is pretty simple. You have the flow copy link here as well. You can just copy links direct to, directly to specific flows and share them. Similarly, if you're here, you can also right click and say copy link to a flow and it's gonna copy that particular link. So if a client pastes it, they're gonna land particularly on that flow as well. So that's that. Resize to actual size. Like for example, if I had this window open, and I expanded it or contracted it to a size and I wanted to restart or basically have it come back to its original size. I can say resize to actual size and it's gonna come back to its actual size just so we can see what it looks like on an actual size. So that's that. Let's talk about autofocus fields. This is pretty simple. If you are adding a flow, um, then it basically automatically focuses on the input field for a, for a flow so you can actually name them appropriately. And not have to actually rename them later on. So just getting into a best habit of renaming flows as soon as you create them. Prototyping with variables, copy and paste local variables. Now this is pretty amazing. Now before we go forward, I would like to let you know that I've recently introduced my premium Figma Noob to Pro course that's gonna help you take your design skills to the next level. It has topics covering from the basics to advanced topics like auto layout, prototyping, components, you name it. 
So if you really want to take your design skills and not only just design skill, but your earning skills and earning potential to the next level as well, definitely go check out the course link in the description. Additionally, I have a voucher code for you guys as well, especially my subscribers and viewers. If you use the AM subscriber voucher, you're going to get a 50% off on that as well. I have a file here which is using a bunch of variables. So for example, I can click on add to cart button and I can increase the cart value. I can decrease it. If it goes below one, then it's going to bring back the add to cart button. And as you can see, we have certain value variables created for this. So in cart number and the not in cart. So now if I was to just, let's say, create a new file, a completely new file, I'm just going to go ahead and create it and I'm going to place it here. And if I just paste my prototype that I had there, as you can see, it's taking some time to paste now. Previously, pasting was a lot faster, but obviously there's a lot of stuff happening now. So when I paste it, hopefully it's going to appear soon. We have the same interaction and variables are copied for that particular interaction as well into this new file. So you don't have to fix these. You don't have to copy the variables again and stuff along those lines. It's much easier to actually move things from one file to another, which is pretty amazing. So I'm going to delete this file because I don't really need it. Okay, so that's done. The other one is inherit modes. Now, this is a pretty interesting one as well. So if we, let's say, just open this particular one, I'm going to open this drop down. As you can see, this drop down opens up. But if I actually have dark mode here, so I'm going to choose the dark mode here. And if I, let's say, refresh and I open the drop down, this, this drop down is also going to inherit the dark mode values that are set here. So obviously, as you can see, in my variables, if I go to, let's say, the colors, I have a light mode color palette and a dark mode color palette, and I've made it inherit um, based on the modes here. And you don't have to do anything. If, for example, your the other thing, the overlay that you're opening, actually has correct light mode and dark mode values set automatically, this is going to be automatic and seamless. Okay, negate a Boolean. A user can now use uh, exclamation mark or not in a Boolean conditional check. This is pretty basic, but I guess like just to explain it, uh, I already have an interaction here, but I'm not going to change anything in the, in the inter interaction. I'm just going to show it by creating a new conditional. So as you can see, I can set a conditional from here. I'm going to say that if, for example, the in cart is not, I can now say not, I can just say not, is not false. And it's going to basically say if not in cart, then I can do something. Right, so it's just an easy way to actually write things out and obviously go ahead and do things. Negative numbers, so instead of let's say saying that I want this to return to the default state when it comes to zero, I can say it should return to the default state when it's minus five. So now if we let's say open this again, zero, minus one, two, three, four, and then on five, it's gonna return to its original state, five original state. So yep, that's pretty much that bind strings to visibility now this is a bit uncommon and it is buggy unfortunately so as you can see i have two variables here or two variants here uh, with the badge on and the badge false using true and false if i wanted to bind this particular value to a variable i can bind it to the boolean values but they're saying i can actually bind it to text values as well so i can bind it to a string or a text value and i can say okay this is going to be my badge on button or something along those lines and the value is going to be true so if i do that as you can see and create the variable it's now going to be linked to that particular text however when i dis detach it and try to link it again i only see the values or the boolean values here i don't really see my text string variable that i actually created so it's not completely functional because if i go here let's say to my collection this is the badge on button and it has a value of true but it doesn't really appear there so obviously that's not working as intended apart from that they had amazing performance uh, updates and it says that it has 22 percent less spinners in key use cases and i have to agree i'm not sure about like the 22 percent but the prototypes now feel a lot faster so i mean props to figma and it's amazing that figma is introducing these awesome updates and not even publishing or creating videos about it i mean it's pretty awesome. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Do subscribe, do hit the bell icon, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.